2014, and we are in Bellingham, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Bellingham Menden Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Marjorie Turner Holman. Our cameraman is Eric Fisher of ABMI Cable 8 TV. We are privileged to have with us today Matt Foley of Franklin, Massachusetts. Matt, would you please tell us your full name and birth date? My name is Matthew Francis Foley. I am 90 years old and I came from, originally came from Norwood, Mass, but now I live in Franklin for the last 54 years. What was your birth date, Matt? My birthday is June 24, 1923. And what was the, what was your hometown? My hometown was Norwood. I lived there till I graduated from high school and then I went in the Navy. I always had a hankering to go in the Navy. When, since I was in the ninth grade, my life was going to be get out of, the, out of school and get in the Navy for 20 years and get my pension and do other things. You know. did, not, did not all work out that way, but it worked out for six years before mm -hmm. I got my pension. Um, what, what made you decide to go into, what, why the Navy? I don't know. I, I just I just love the Navy, and I come from Ireland, where all my people were seagoing people lived right on the Cape Line, you know, right on the shoreline, and that had a lot of interest. In fact, that after I got out of the Navy, I went to Ireland six or seven times to visit my relatives that were still living. Some of them. Okay, you know. and you volunteered then. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, what What year did you volunteer? 1941. Okay. I, I can't give you, I, I think something like high school was, I got graduated from high school when the 12th of June, and then about the 20th of June I went in down to Newport, Rhode Island, where I had my boot camp. Okay. Um, now, tell us about the members of your family who have served in the military, Matt. Well, first we have uh, uh, my son. Uh, they, uh, Matthew, named after me, Matthew Jr. He went in the Air Force. He was in uh, Tan Sanut and uh, my, my mem memory kind of slips on it, but Vietnam he was in. Mm -hmm. And he was in right to the end there. And then next to him came uh, Dennis, who was in the Air Force, in, in the Navy, and he uh, I, I don't know the number of years, but it was three or four years for all of them that were there. And uh, he was in the Air Force on a carrier, a big large carrier, which caught on fire during the, during the uh, gunfire from the, uh, from the shoreline. You know. And after Dennis came David, and David was 11 years after Dennis was born, David was 11 years later. You know, mm -hmm. so. He was a spoiled brat. Uh, uh, and every time, every time he squawked, someone picked him up and patted him on the back. But he turned out great. He's now living in Maine. He did three or four years in the Navy, and he loves it. And uh, uh, we seem to be a, uh, a seagoing bunch. And after they, after David, the, we, the grandkids came in, and uh, the first two were Heather. And Heather we have and Nicholas. a picture of her in Afghanistan. Heather and Nicholas. Yes, that's her. Her bum sticking up in the air. <laughs> they were out in the desert, and they got. She was running that. I, they don't call it a tank. It, had, it was bigger than a tank. Had a different name, but you can see by the hubcap there how deep they were on the desert. And there was a bunch of those. That kind of. Uh, machine that was there stuck with them. Okay. They were in a dangerous position and could be, could be worse, but it came out wonderful. And her, her tank, or whatever you want to call it, she, she did a good job on it. You, know. mm -hmm. That's, you can't see her face, but you might, might have a picture of her face later on. I, I don't. None. But you also have a grandson. I have a grandson, Nicholas, yes. Nicholas went in the Coast Guard, did four years. There he is. Yeah. That's, that's Nick, yeah, in four years in the Coast Guard. And he, I don't know why he didn't like us. He got out of, the, out of the Coast Guard and went into the 
um, Air Force. And uh, he, he, like, he stayed two years, I think, in the North Force. He was up in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And then he got out and went to other. He's met, now married and lives in Va Maine. Okay. Well, now you said you entered the service in 1941. This right. was prior to World War I, World yes. War being declared for the U.S. World War II, excuse yes. me. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to keep that in mind. Um, but please tell us a little about your boot camp experience. Well, when I first went in there, I thought, oh my God, they're going to kill me. But uh, <laughs> they didn't. They made us squeal a little bit. And I, I loved the Navy, even the boot camp. And there you are. Yeah, because I was a, <laughs> yeah, that was a beaut. Uh, that was out around the captain's quarters the, in, in boot camp. We had, always had to have someone on guard there because there was a man with a braid on his arm there. You know. Wasn't any better than us, but he was a pretty good guy. And, and where was your boot camp? Where did boot you go? Boot camp was at Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. They had a base there. I don't think it's there anymore. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sure it isn't. Okay. And so boot camp was not a tough experience for you? It wasn't to me. It, it brought out the, ba the best in you, you know. They saw no problem in getting you up and do a five-mile hike. I was always in pretty good shape. I was a skinny kid muscular kid. I, I wasn't into sports or anything, but I was always out in the woods, hunting, fishing, that, that bit, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I just liked it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so where were you stationed after boot camp, and, and tell us about your duties. After boot camp, I picked up the, the USS Brooklyn in Norfolk, Norfolk, uh, Virginia? USA, yeah. Okay. Um, Went there and uh, we were there. They were in. They were in. Uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out what they called it. Well, they were in for repairs. They had a special name for it, but I can't recall it right now. And when they got through with the repairs, we pulled out, came up uh, to New York, and went from New York off to the uh, Mediterranean. We were in the Mediterranean. There was a. Then we we went. We used to go out of the Mediterranean, up the eastern coast there, and look for submarines. Who we, we were looking for us? The German submarines. And, and what kind of a ship were you stationed? I was on? a light cruiser, and it also had four planes, four two, two wing planes that went out and spotted the um, submarines. They could see it from the shore, from the air. And we couldn't see them from the shore. You know, all we always had a had someone on, on watch, and they're looking through glasses. And sometimes you could get the periscope and see it. And, and the planes went over and dropped bombs on them, and we dropped depth charges from the ship when they went in and out and in and out, and dropped these uh, depth charges. And we don't know how many we got or whether we got any, but. Uh, and this was on the USS Brooklyn? This is on the USS Brooklyn, okay, yes. Okay, you've got your hat there. Yeah, a hat I'm proud of. Okay, now before war was declared, um, you weren't doing all these? Yeah, before war, we, we were doing the same thing. We, we were on patrol. We patrolled from, from Iceland down, I don't know just where we went. We went uh, to Iceland and Newfoundland and, and, and just go back and forth on the on the east coast, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what we killed that time. We were off Bermuda when we had a uh, over the loudspeaker. The captain wanted to speak to the crew, so we were at attention, and he told us that war had been declared, and we had to go to a place that was off of Bermuda somewhere. I don't know the name of the island, but they were equipped with five. Uh, five ships that were lined up with the Nazi. They were French, though. Jean Marie, Jean something was that. I think a Jean Marie was a French battleship. But they had a battleship and a cruiser and a couple little destroyers down there. And, and we, at the time, would, were a cruiser with like two or three destroyers. And our job was to go down and get rid of them. 
they wouldn't put it in that words, but that's what we all felt we had to do. And um, this was right so, after Pearl Harbor. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't know how many days afterward, but it was it was close. Mm -hmm. And um, we went down there, and before we even got close to the island, they uh, gave up their guns and or suck. They silenced their guns anyhow and put the American flag up on the staff, and and we had those on our side. I didn't trust them too much, but they were on our side. So. <laughs> okay. Oh my goodness. Um, well, once war was declared, uh, World War II, you were into this. Um, I, I'd like you to just talk to us about life aboard the, the ship and, um, you know, what you would do during... Yeah, just, just about your sleeping quarters, your food. Mm -hmm. You talked about being in the midst of battles and having to keep eating yep. because things would go on for yep. days. Can you tell us a little yes, bit about I can. that? We, uh, uh, when I went in, I was, I was awed with the size of the ship. It was a 188 feet long, you know, and it was, uh, had 15 uh, six-inch guns on it and some five-inch guns and all kinds of uh, 50, 50 caliber guns, all kinds of uh, uh, things to hurt people. And we cruised up and down the, up and down the Atlantic as far as Iceland, I was on it, as far as Iceland, Newfoundland. Um, then we stopped at, we used to stop at Maine once in a while, then down back to uh, New York, Norfolk, go out again. It was a constant thing. Go back and get a few repairs done and get, uh, give the guys a little bit of liberty, not much, but a little. And uh, we enjoyed that. And then we had skirmishes with uh, Nazi planes. Didn't, they didn't come too close to us at that time, but they, they were, apparently they weren't brave enough to do it or, I don't know what the answer is, but they didn't bother us when we were there. And then we went, when war was declared, we went through... Uh, so this was all prior to, war, to Pearl Harbor, you were saying you, you had were, those skirmishes. You, yeah. you oh were, my goodness, okay. You, you were on the go all the time, and you made stops, but they were stop, uh, short stops, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the ship had to be cleaned up. And there's one interesting thing on that, there was we came on the ship and I thought it was beautiful until they gave us what we called a, um, we had, it was like a, a broom stick like that. Now they have a, a piece of uh, teak. Uh, we had a uh, teak wood deck and we had, this was like sandpaper, this little piece and we were bent over going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, uh, the bosom mate determined how many, how many times you, you went back and forth. This was a polishing the deck? Polishing the, the teak wood deck, yeah. And, and it, was it was absolutely beautiful. But when that, when that uh, war started, we went back to, uh, to Brooklyn and they ripped the deck off. And we were just a metal deck then. And still looked good to me, but it was uh, you were walking on a deck, walking on wood. What, wasn't much comfort in it. It wasn't know? very pretty. It was beautiful. <laughs> and I never got a piece of the teak wood deck that we took off. I don't, I don't know where I was when they did it, but I didn't get it. And... Uh, well, you described having to keep eating while, while some of these skirmishes would be going on over days. Oh, yeah. We, did, we uh, didn't miss any... Can you tell us about that? We didn't miss too many meals. We had, a, we had a 1,400 people were on the ship. And uh, we got fed in the in the in the in the deck. The uh, f I can't remember the name of the deck. It's the food deck, anyhow. We go down there and we all piled in and got in line. I was lucky because I would, our my division and the division I eventually got to rule was up on near turret two, and the the uh, food was right down below. It was close closer to midship shipland. And uh, someone had to go up, and I used to go up because I got my choice of the food. Right, I have. Well, we have. Oh. Excuse, 
We have a picture of the, the, the crew in the galley because they had to keep cooking for you all this time. Yeah. There yeah, they are. That, that looks like to me like a turkey we had for Christmas or That's New probably Year's. your Christmas menu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but there was nothing. There you go. There was, there was nothing wrong with the food. It just wasn't what, the, what, what mom gave us. It wasn't it didn't have that loving care, but uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was good. I, I never had a job of uh, food I didn't like. You know. So, so not MREs. You didn't have the meals ready to eat. You had real food. Oh, oh we had real food. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't like it. Some of, some of the things that, that if you talk to people who were on my ship, they, oh, do you remember that GD salmon that we used to get? You know, I liked the GD salmon. <laughs> <laughs> So I was in the, in the minority of most of the things. And the thing, we had to stand watch 24 hours a day. We did it four on four, four on eight. And that was the, the most we got off was uh, from eight to, Jet, Reveille was all, all, I was all up at dawn. I, I, I always got early and got up and I loved to see the sun come up over the sunshine. Being at sea is just a beautiful thing, beautiful. And, the food wasn't that bad. There's, you know, you could you, you you gripe at food with food at, at night that are at home that your mother makes. You know, geez, ma, what did you do to that? You know, it's not like that. It was you get used to everything. Mm -hmm. I was born to be a sailor, I think, and I, and I did six years of it, and then I got out and met Muggsy, and we got married. And uh, Muggsy is your wife. Muggsy is my wife, Margaret. yeah, and we've okay. been married now 69 years. Three kids, Matthew, the oldest boy, is we buried him three years ago, and there's two living now, and five grandchildren, and f two great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. They were doing all right, and my health is pretty good, so I'm going to be around for, I figure, another ten years until I kiss them all goodbye. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to take you back to your wartime days a little bit. Yeah. And ask if you would tell us first, I, I know you were a wire splitter. Can you tell us a little bit about Well, that, what? Was, that was just for the maintenance of the thing. Every, everything aboard ship at that time was a wire rope. And you, when, you, when you tied up, when you hoisted boats, when they, everything was done with either manila, manila rope or wire rope. And I, I don't know how they gave me that title, but the, both of them got all titles. We, our, our, I think, I believe our t title was discipline. We had the run of the ship, all the, all the top side was both mates, both mates, and six divisions, I think it was. And eventually I got to be the boss of, of division two. That's a, that's a good position too. You know? You did what you had to do. Every, every morning you got up, you had breakfast, then you went up and, and uh, usually the boat's mate had all the things lined up for you to do the cleaning. You always did back and forth on the deck when it was wood. And when it was high and you had to clean it all down every day, salt water was piling on it, but you still had to get everything clean. It was, they, were, they were bugs for clean, but, but it gave you a chance to wipe down the the handrails and all that, and you saw, saw dolphins go by, flying fish, and sometimes you'd see sea guns, you're two or three hundred seagulls, two or three miles, hundred miles from shore, and you wonder how they got there. Probably on a cargo ship, we don't know. And we took uh, cargo ships over to Europe, the war was going on then, to be guided by us and by destroyers to keep the uh, submarines away from them. And uh, we did that all day after day after day. And if we were lucky when we got into shore and we had to, the ships had to uh, unload what they brought over, we got a couple of days off and got time to see the town, which it, whatever it was, you know. Mm -hmm. So we got to places I never would have seen, mostly North Africa and down, down and, and up the uh, Italian coast. Okay. Um, well, you talked a little bit about um, segregation aboard your ship, and I, I wish you would tell us. Bothered me, bothered me roughly. I, I, I was never a segre segregation man, and uh, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that uh, 
I love all people. I think we we all meant to be friends and be be the best we can out of what we have. And we had, I don't know the exact number. I'd say if I put a 25, I might be wrong one way or the other. But they were there for the use of the officers and the captain. And uh, they didn't couldn't eat with us. They had their own mess mess room. This is this is Negroes, blacks were segregated and ate separately. Black and 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 also there was uh, they weren't all black. They had some. Uh, I can't think of the nationality or yellow type. Thing. Or Asian. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, some some of those. So they were segregated as well. Yes, with the blacks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I've always been deathly against it. There's no no need of it. You know, I, and of course, the, and I always felt bad. I was always a guy that loved the in, Indians. You know, and they were segregated right from the bottom when we when we beat them out of their land. And, uh, so you, d I I think I heard you before describing separate separate living quarters. separate living quarters. Yes, yes, and. And uh, we weren't stopped for going in there. I went in and made friends with him. I had a guy named Johnny Williams, I think his name was, and he had two kids and a wife. He was always after me to come over, go on liberty with him, you know. And, and unconsciously, I was pushing him away. And I wanted to say, something's wrong here. So he, he got me again. And I said, that's the last time you're going to ask me. I said, I'm going to show with you tonight. We had liberty. So we went, out, went over his home, saw his kids and his wife. And it was, uh, we made pretty good friends for the time we were on the ship. You know? Of course, I got a lot of flack from some of my shipmates that didn't like the blacks. You know? mm -hmm. So it was going on in 1941. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. OK. Um, you, see, you saw active combat through World War II. And I wish you would describe a little bit about what that was like, what you saw, and how it felt. So much of it was scattered all over. The, the first thing we had was the, one, <clears throat> the ships that were closer to Bermuda, that we got them to surrender. And that was nothing. Nothing was fired at us. Then we went to a place in northern, Sit northern um, Africa. I can't think the name of the town, but there was several towns along the coast, and our job was to go in from 13 to 25 miles and throw slugs, six-inch slugs at them. Three, three come out of each ship at you the were, same time. We had you had a record of ca being at Casablanca. At Casablanca. Casablanca was one of our bases. Once we got it loose, we used to go back there for liberty too. But that was one of the, one of the places that we took over. And there was many, many of them. Uh, we were called to go down to, I don't know the name now, but go down to a certain thing, and we'd go down and fire several or many ships of, of, of the, of the uh, many of these missiles that we had. The missile was six-point missile. It was about 18 inches long, followed by probably 20 inches of powder to propel the, the slug out all over the shore. And I was lucky at, at the time, I was a on and off gun, gun troll guy. So I got a chance to sit with the union, that, with the, uh, not the union, the officer that was in the turret. It gave me a peek out the periscope and you could see where the, the bullets were dropping you know, and you'd see whole houses and everything fall it wasn't pretty it, uh, we didn't get it didn't get ashore to see any blood and guts we saw you know from long 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 periods of space there that was between us and them but they shot back and they could hit us if they could figure out where we were and thank god they didn't we got one one hit by a piece of slug and wasn't much and uh, we had one killed on the board of the ship, and uh, we buried one sailor at sea, and that was about the gist of all our troubles. We had a lot of people griping, but that's they wanted to go home, they wanted to do this, but our our quarters were clean because we kept them clean. We had to. 
I, I heard, in our discussion earlier, you talked about watching a torpedo come towards yes. you. Could you tell us a little bit about that? That was a. Uh, I was I was on. I happened to be on on torpedo watch, and and as we said, we had places they were. I don't know whether they were round or square, but anyhow, there were six or eight places where you had spy glasses looking out at the water, and what you were looking for was a piece of submarine come up six to eight, ten inches, might have been more on and we'd tell it to the bridge and zip, they get a lot of sh destroyers or and planes in the air, see if we could sink it. And I don't remember any of these submarines coming up after we dropped mm -hmm. bombs on them, you know, but hopefully we did. You know. And that was, uh, that was, that's on and off. When we were in Anzio, that was where we had the most, uh, the most stuff that was fl thrown at us, uh, guns and submarines and bombs. And it, it wasn't a pretty sight. We were lucky. We, we got a little shrapnel, but there wasn't anything that we had to worry about. I guess at the time we had to worry about it, but we had a skipper and I think he was on board at time. He turned out to be an admiral, dinner break, terrific man, and, and uh, he, he was he was a, a, a just he was. They said he was a rough guy. I didn't find a rough guy. I have a story I might tell out about him, but um, the Italians and the and the French that were that were against us and the Germans that were against us all had artillery along the coast that they fired at us and tried to sell it, kill us. And they did kill. I saw two British ships get sunk and two or three more get hit and get out of there. We didn't, thank God. We didn't get too many, maybe little pieces of shrapnel or something. Or, uh, we'd see bombs f falling close to us, not hitting us. So not, that doesn't count though. So, yeah. So we came out of Anzio, which was horrible. We went back there, I think we went back there three times. It was a tough base to, to kill, kill the Germans off, to drive them out. And now, I think that may have been where the bridge was that you, we have that picture of. Is that, yeah. was that Anzio? Yeah, that was, that was part of Anzio. It was in the Anzio area, yes. Okay, oh, there it is. Yeah, there's, there's the bridge, yeah. No, there's no and bridge course, when there. You, <laughs> when you get a bridge like that, I, I don't know much about it except that we knocked it out. And, and probably that was a main line on the shore f to get supplies for the Germans to that place and to further on. And you can see that the water was right there. We were probably 10 or 15 miles out. And you see they had mountains in, in Italy too. Okay. Anzio is in which country? I, I think it was Italy. I, I, I'm not too sure of that. Yeah, it was. I think so. Okay. Um, I seem to remember you talking about a gun that would come out on the this train was, track. This was was that that bridge? That was that, that down from the bridge. Yeah, they had a, there was a gun that was uh, situated, I think it was, we determined that it was the, situated in a cave on railroad tracks. And they would roll it back in the cave, throw throw a few shots at us, and get back out, back in again, out of out of range. And we'd wait for them to come out. And if we could figure the right time, we fire the shots at them. And they never hit us, and we hit them. Finally, we knocked them out. Not by we, I mean all the ships that were there. We didn't do it all. We did our part of it. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, this Captain Dinnerbring. We had tremendous man, tremendous man. Now, once you would clear out a town, you were, I, did, tell us about going ashore. Yeah, we were granted the right to go to shore, and uh, it was horrible to see all, the, all of the Italians. Italy is a beautiful, beautiful state or city, whatever you want to call it. But uh, after the war, they were, they destroyed most of the property, it was awful. And I had a little incident that, uh, I think I told you, but a little girl used to come up at, at night. She'd pull you on your on your on your dungarees or whatever. We didn't wear dungarees then, but we had our blues on, you know. And I got to so I knew a few names, a few pieces of Italian. As you were there, you're long, you you could talk a little bit. But anyhow, 
she and I spoke broke, broken Italian, you know, and, and then I used to bring her lollipops and candy that I got out of our ship's gee dunk stand. That's what the ice cream and candy was called, the gee dunk. And I'd bring it over to her, you know. I took a lot of flack from some of the guys. What the hell are you doing with that little kid? She's six or eight years old, you know, and, and she'd wait for me and I'd bring her something. And then for one day she, she kept talking and talking and pointing and, and I, uh, I didn't know what she wanted. And I said, the house? And then she described the house that, yeah, yeah, she wanted me to go to a house. So she took me home and I met her mother and the mother had, there was three other kids at home there and they, they fed me what sparse food they had, you know, and, and I stayed with them. And that uh, was quite an experience. And they gave me, the little girl gave me a little hanky that she made out of lace. And I don't know where I lost it, but I did, you know, and uh, quite an experience. And uh, that little kid I often thought could have been killed, you know, mm -hmm. or her father been killed. And you didn't see many men in these towns because they were at the front fighting for the Germans. If they didn't fight for the Germans, the Germans had them in jail or something like that. You know. mm -hmm. Okay. Um, talk, talk to us about some of the other places that you went ashore. I, I think we've got a picture of you in Algeria. Yeah. Algeria, I don't... I, there's, I, your, there's your crew with the... Oh, that was, that was that's all the bosun mates. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that, that's the coxswains and bosun mates of the of the USS Brooklyn. I'm over over on the right, the second second uh, thing down, right at the second row down, right at the left. That's me. Okay. And those are the ones. I don't know why they took that picture, except the photographer had it, had like you had itchy fingers. And he talked to the photographer, and, the, and the, or we might have been on liberty, because we went on liberty too. Although we didn't wear our blues, we had our dress blues there. We didn't didn't win those on liberty very much. Well, what would you do when you went on sh on shore? To have these a few different few towns? brews, t taste <laughs> t tasty alcohol alcohol drinks that they had there. I didn't drink too much at the time. I was only 17 or 18 years old. And I always marveled at the fact that the more sailors I met, they were all my age, and I figured at the end there that, geez, it was all kids from 17 to probably 25 that did all the, all the winning, all the fighting and the killing. You didn't see too many people over 25 there. I don't know where they were. They probably would say they were over there. They did the, the negotiating from miles behind us, you know. Mm -hmm. Like you read them in the paper, just, there was a few of them that were, were right up in the front end, but not in the Navy. Mm -hmm. Well, and speaking of young people, you have a picture of some orphans that you visited yeah, in Malta. The, I don't know that it was, uh, they came to Malta. I, th I don't know if the, if the, uh, and if you the orphanage was, was at Malta. But we went over to see them, brought food over, and little games and things we had, and played with them. It was just a, just a nice break from the tedium of of uh, scrubbing decks and all that baloney. You know. Did you go and play with the children, bring them food, yes, clothes, yeah. and I did. I did. You know, yeah, yeah. I talked to most of the kids, I, just like they were my own. You know, and I met a lot of them. You know, yeah. And we we get to we went to Scotland too. I I met a lot of white girls up there, and uh, of course I had Muggsy at home. We weren't married yet, but I could look at a girl and not just get killed. <laughs> and uh, Africa Africa was a, a lot of surprise. There was one place there that they made a movie of it. Um, oh boy, I can't think of the name of it. There was a Big, it was a big movie, and there was famous famous people that were in it, and I can't think of the name of it. But we went there, and I was disappointed. It was a dirty hole. It was wasn't like it was on the movie at all. We went down a long alleyway, and it was 
and it probably wasn't their fu their fault. They were in the middle of a war and people shooting at them all the time, so they were. I know you were in Casablanca. Was Casablanca. that one of the uh, towns yeah, that, you're that, thinking that, of, or something else? Uh, I don't remember much about it except that we were allowed to go in Liberty, and they, there's, every every Liberty you got had bar rooms on them. That's how they, the men made the men and the women made the money. Uh, what money they could get. At least that's the way I took it. And, uh, every, everyone was the something, the architecture and just the people themselves. And I, 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 I liked going around meeting different people, you know, and, and uh, that's, that was where I spent my liberties. You know. mm -hmm. um, tell us about your visit to Rome. Oh, I, I went up there three times, I think. I went up to see Pius XII. The fir first time I went up there. And there's a picture of. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the Vatican, yeah. And he had off to the right there. He used to come out on a balcony and give a talk, and we planned that we would see him. We, we, we missed him all three times. But we, there was a five of us that went on liberty that the one time I'm talking about. and. Uh, Someone says that uh, we, we ought to get the Pope to bless our, our rosaries and medals that we picked up to bring home to our people. And uh, I was elected to go see the Pope. So I asked the, the Swiss guard if uh, that was possible. He says, it's possible. He says, but I don't know whether he'll see you. I'll, I'll go ask him. So he went up and he came back and he said, I forget how he called him, His Majesty or something. It wasn't that, I'm sure, but the the Pope uh, can't see you now. He's busy with something. Or other. You know, he was uh, ruling millions of Catholics throughout the world, and uh, to me, that was a, at the time that was a good thing. And uh, I saw him three times. Yeah, and uh, and I like the Pope that's in there now. Mm -hmm. This man's going to make a lot of changes, I think. He's making newspapers. Splashes, as you can probably see, and I can't think of. Well, you were talking about somebody who became admiral. I bet. Oh, the people admiral, said they were admiral, so tough, but you had an encounter with him. Admiral, would admiral, you, admiral you? dinner break. Yes, I think he's the one. But I used to go after I was through my <clears throat> my day's work as a bosun mate. I used to take a shower and I'd go up and I'd walk around the the, the deck up as far as it would go in and back beyond my turret and around deck. And I was walking up and down and someone put their finger on my sweatshirt, the little shirt that I have underneath here. And I turned around with a fist or going to slug someone and it was an officer, you know. And he says, keep walking. And he's, he kept tearing as I kept walking, you know. He says, now he says, you go down and get a decent, uh, what do they call them? Underwear. They didn't call on the skivvies, I guess it was. But there Just, was a hole in your shirt that he yeah, found. In my skivvies, yeah. There was a hole, yeah. It was ripped off me by the time I got to go down. And he said, come back up. He said, we'll have a little chat. And I thought he was going to bawl me out, but he didn't. And he said, he got my name and had, just like you are, you know. He got all the credentials, credentials down. And, uh, and uh, I said to him, I got, got kind of brave then. And I said, well, you know all about me. I said, how about me knowing a little about you? I was prepared to do that, he said. And he told me about, he came in as an apprentice seaman. That's the lowest you can go in the Navy. He went to the Naval Academy and became a, an ensign, I guess, and went on up and he was Admiral Lind when he was on our ship, you know. Terrific man, yeah. yeah. And uh, when, he, when he had to come aboard ship, I used to have to, if you were on duty, you had a, a bosun's pipe. It was about that long. You put it in your mouth and you go, doo like something like that. But the do, the U had to go until he got on the gangway all the way up and onto the ship's deck and saluted the officer on duty, asked for permission to come aboard. And that, the boss of me was there, and I, he, I got it more than anyone because he knew me. You had to do that until he stopped whistling. <laughs> He'd look over at me and go. <laughs> and 
and that was that was my big day in, in the Navy. And uh, I had I didn't have any bad ones. I had a lot of good ones. I, I liked the Navy. It was tough. You know, there were there were times that we we didn't get the best to eat, but we got good stuff. You know, and and. When we hit rough seas, like up in Iceland and Newfoundland, uh, my God, you hit some rough, rough water up there. That ship was come up high and then slam right down. You know, and boy, if you're on deck, you better be tied to something. You know? Did you ever get seasick? No, never, never. That's my ancestors I blame for that. They, they were out at sea in little rowboats, you know, yeah, fishing. Yeah. Now, what, did you stay in the service all through World War II? Yes, yeah, I was out. Uh, when I was out, I, I got transferred. <clears throat> I got a little bit bored with the Brooklyn because we weren't doing much. We were in and out of tours, and they were re making all kinds of repairs and sh uh, shipping people out. Now, all except me, they wouldn't ship me out because they'd say, you're a CBS man. I said, what the hell does that mean? Can't be spared. So I, I felt a little bit proud that I couldn't be spared, but I, then I looked around and I said, any idiot could do what I'm doing. So anyhow, I, I was walking up the deck one day and my friend who was a, 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 a yeoman, he had a bunch of paper in his hand, and, and I says, where are you going? He said, I've got to go down and get the officer. I, I don't know if it was the officer of the deck or something. There's some, some officer in here. Had to go get these signs. Oh, I said, how does he sign them? He says, just brush it all like that, and he signs them on the bottom. I said, oh, you want another one? What are you trying to do? <laughs> just take this up and put it in here and get it signed for me. And two weeks later, I was shipped off of the ship, off of the Brooklyn. And my, my officer of the, my division, I don't know how you did it, he said, but you must have relatives in there, you know. No, just good friends. <laughs> Where did that take you? Would it took me to, to Brooklyn itself, where I spent about a week at a base in Brooklyn. And then I went over to Bayonne, New Jersey, and they had a degaussing division over there. Degaussing was a cable they, they raped off, wrapped around the ships to protect them from the mines. I don't know how to protect them. This all. was while the war was still going on? Uh, no, I think the war was over then, okay. because they, they, now I don't know whether they're taking them off or they were putting them on, but they were working with the Gaussian periods, you know, mm -hmm. because they went home shortly after that, so the war was all over then. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then you got married and stayed in the reserves? I, no, I didn't. I got out of the nerve entirely. I was in the reserve, yeah, but, but I didn't, I wasn't in the active reserve. I stayed in the stayed in the reserve all my life, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, but I, I went home and got a job. Uh, yeah, tell us about finding jo work after World War II. A lot of people had trouble I had finding no, work. I had no had no job, no trouble at all. I first went, I went out looking one Monday morning, and I was sick as a dog. I don't know why. I had a headache and I didn't feel good. And I went into a foundry, and uh, he showed me what they did. Uh, wasn't, wasn't too, didn't impress me too much. I think I could handle it, you know, so I says, okay. So he says, come back next Monday, you know. Well, next Monday come, and I already had gone to the Plimpton Press. So I called the guy down. In, at the, in Walpole? Yeah, no, Norwood. It was Norwood. Okay. So uh, I called the guy down the foundry, told him I couldn't take his job. I found another one. He cursed me and <laughs> let me go. But anyhow, I got into Plimpton Press. And uh, shortly afterwards, they made me an apprentice under the GI Bill. I spent uh, four years as an apprentice and learned all about printing. And then I went on in printing to be active in the unions and, uh, and active in my division. In that part, I was one of the leaders. That I like to think I did the most and the best work, but uh, that's probably not true. But I loved printing, and I got to 30 years I was there, and uh, one day the, the, someone come up and say, hey Matt, did you hear about that new school there building down in Easton, Northeastern? I said, no, where is it? He told me about it, and he said, 
they got a print shop in there. He says, you ought to go down and get a, see if you can get a job. I said, no, I don't think I'd be a teacher. You do it here. I said, yeah. And then, so we mulled it over and I got another guy to go down with me. And we went in and we were supervised there by the, by the God Almighty, Mr. Graves. He was the, the best superintendent of the school, you know. And he told us all about it and what we had to do and what we didn't, couldn't do. And so anyhow, we were hired and at very little pay. But uh, when I was in there, I, I really liked it. I didn't, the first day at the school, I, I'll never forget it. I didn't know what to do. I took a piece of chalk and I wrote my name on the, on the blackboard just to get things going. Then who are you and who are you and who are you? And I killed the whole period finding, letting them who I was and who they were, you know. Then I went around and talked to a few teachers and got a few methods of teaching, you know. And I used the same things that I had at Plimpton Press, like just how to how to do a piece. And in those days, everything was single pieces of of lead where, where you picked picked them up like this and put them in a stick. And, and, and make a word out of it, and make three words, and paragraphs, and put them all together. And then you had to hold them together when you take them out of the, out of the pan and put them in the device. I don't know the name of it now, but age has taken some of my memory away from me. You know? But anyhow, I did 19 years there, and I decided to get out. And I, when I got out, I was, I, I've always been a gardener. I got a garden started and everything. And, I was still bored, didn't have enough to do, so I went up to the, I think I didn't have enough exercise. I went up to the YMCO, CA, C-A-S-E-O, mm -hmm. and uh, I worked in there, and a girl named Ginger, I, her last name's not important right now, her name was Ginger, a sweetheart of a woman. She was after me all the time, Matt, come on and help me, you know. I said, Ginger, I'm busy helping myself. I, I need somebody here to help me, and you, you look like the fine ass. Oh, damn it, give me the thing. What do you want me to do? She says, I want you to take care, come in and open up in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. And I was, a, I was one that got up early every time, and I said, I guess I'm not gonna live that behind me. So anyhow, I went in there and every morning for 12 years, I opened up the, place there and had a great time and one a lot of people and when I finally got out of there I got out because I fell down twice and hit my head and got knocked out hit it again got knocked out and so I don't go, don't go near the Y anymore and I, I have that dizziness spell they have a name for it but I don't know what it is and as long as I can have my cane and do my bit I'm all right you talked about one, doing a little bit of gardening, but you, there was a reason you moved to the Franklin area, and I wish you would tell yes. us about that. Yeah, I was looking for a place to, to have, a, have a farm, a small farm, and raise different types of variety of farmers, of animals. And I, I couldn't afford, number one. Number two, I couldn't find a place that was the right size or the right place, so I had all trees, I had an acre and a quarter of land on my land, and all my land was in trees, big trees like that. So I started cutting down trees. I cut down 48 trees. This is in, in the property in, in Franklin? In the property that I had, okay. yeah. And, and uh, I gave most of the wood, I gave away for firewood. People put a sign out front, people came and took the wood away from me. And then I, excuse me, I made a deal to guy uh, to plow it harrow it and get it all ready so I could plow. I planted, I planted a garden up there first and then I sectioned off a plant and I got a, a cow. That was the first thing I got, a cow that was to be used for meat. Then the next year I got a couple of pigs in there and after that I started on chickens and turkeys and ducks and geese. <laughs> you name it and fully had it. And, uh, and the, uh, I, have a, a, I have a direct love for the Portuguese people. They, they, they love rabbits and chickens to eat, like I do. And every Saturday, my driveway was piled with those people, with their bags to take the, 
the animals home. I raised thousands of rabbits, you know, and enjoyed it until I fell down and then my kids are ripping the barn down now. Okay. No more, no more of that. And they're right. Uh, you know, it's time for me to, I don't know what it's time for me to do, but this is something I'm doing. There were ways that you gave back to the community, not just working with the YMCA, but also you mentioned something about Boy Scouts. Would you tell oh, us I a spent, little yes, bit? Yes, when I, when I first came out, came out of the service, I got in the Boy Scouts. I spent 25 years on the in and out there. I was, I was a scoutmaster and uh, loved it. Uh, we, we went on, on a hike uh, once a month. We went off, and one time I told I had the mothers and fathers there, I said, I'm going to have a big hike up to Newfound Lake. You know, and uh, oh, gee, the mothers didn't want that, didn't want that. And they said, how many kids are going? I said, as many as they want. And then I ended up with two kids. And two of them were doctor's kids. One was a, a dentist and the other one was a regular doctor. And we went up to Newfound Lake and we, we hiked 52 miles, full pack. I did all, the, all of the cooking, and the kids did the cleanup and swam in a couple of ponds that were along the way. I had a time of my life. And uh, that was, I, 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 liked, I liked Boy Scouts. Uh, not, there's not enough of them in there. I don't know why. And well, you have a connection to Bellingham is why we have you here today and I met you at the Bellingham Men's Group. Could you tell us a little bit about them before we yeah. wrap up? I met, I met uh, Paul Peter. Uh, the name intrigued me. Paul intrigued me. We became friends, you know, and, and uh, he came up one day and said, I'm going to a meeting. He said, over in Bellingham, you want to come with me? You know? I mean, what's it like? Uh, we just sit around and shoot the bull. Yeah, I'm good at that. So I went over to Bellingham with him. And I don't know how long it's been now. He, a year, I think, or something like that. And we sit, sit in a group and someone throws something out and if you got something to say, you say it. If you don't, you don't. And it's, uh, it's very, very good. And I've met some people that appreciate my time in the Navy you know, and, and mention it to me. And one guy shook my hands and he says, I hope to God I look like you when I'm 90 years old like you are, you know, and still active, you know. And I hope that I'm going to be active like that. And I, I got a wife that I'm trying to push into being active, but she's active in the house, but and active with me. So mm -hmm. she's she's be she'll be 50 in September. I'll be 51 in June. 50 and 51. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she'll be 50. I, I heard 50. last I checked you were 90. 91. 91. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the little things in there aren't working real well. Yeah, she'll be 90, I'll be 91. I'm sorry. Uncle Sam would like that probably. <laughs> Any, anything else you would like to share before we wrap up, Matt? Anything that's come to mind? No, I think the, the town of Franklin is a, is a wonderful place. I, I like it very, very much. And, I never found the farm that I was going to move to, but I visited a lot of them. In fact, I'm looking to go to one now and get my tomato and plants and pepper plants and eggplants and start my garden over for the new year. You, you still have a beautiful garden. Yeah. Yeah. I try. You succeed. Thank you so much, Matt. Really appreciate you coming and talking with us today. I'm really glad to be here, yeah. and I'm not as nervous as I thought I'd be. You did fine. <laughs> We've been speaking today with Matt Foley, World War II veteran of the U.S. Navy. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you to ABMI for their support of this project. We will be sending copies of all these interviews to the Library of Congress to become part of the permanent record here. We also thank the Massachusetts Cultural Council for their support of this project, the Bellingham portion of the Massachusetts Cultural Council. This project is supported in part by them. Now, any veteran who has ties to Bellingham or Menden is encouraged to contact us 
to arrange to be interviewed here at ABMI Cable 8, please call ABMI Cable 8 TV at 508-966-3234 or email me, Marjorie Turner Holman, at marjorie at marjorieturner.com. The phone number for the station and my email will be in the credits at the end of the program. Each person's story is unique. We'd love to hear them. We'd love to have you.